So our first speaker who will be speaking about building full stack apps is Ryan. Take it away, Ryan. Thank you very much. has been live streamed and there's so many of you here tonight so it's um, I'm super excited. Um, my talk tonight is probably not as technical as the other two guys but I'm hoping that it'll resonate with you. Um, I'm talking about building full stack applications and products but I'm going to talk about some of the non-technical aspects about that, some of the business considerations you might make, some of the lessons I've learned along the way and maybe um, we'll have a bit of a discussion at the end because I haven't actually timed how long this talk is so we'll see how that goes. Um, but without further ado, I'll jump right into it. Um, really the first thing is being a generalist is a skill in itself. Um, we all focus on having specific skill sets. You know, People categorise themselves as a front-end developer, a back-end developer, a DBA or something, a test or whatever. But I'm going to kind of come at this from a different angle and propose that we look at things as a broader spectrum. So I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this quote, a jack of all trades is a master of none. But show of hands, does anyone know the full quote for this, the actual, the real quote for this? Right, this has made my point fantastic. I was worried that you were all going to put your hands up there and it'd be an absolute killer. Um, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Now, that really is the premise of my talk today and my view on just software development, your job, your life, to be honest, right? I like it to be as diverse as possible. Um, a few people that are here, like uh, Stephen, uh, he always winds me up because I say too many quotes, so that is actually the only one that I've got today. Um, but essentially, we view being a generalist as a negative thing, as, as according to that quote, right? It's a, it's a negative thing if you're not a master in one specific thing, but I challenge that and actually say that it's the exact opposite. So for me, my experience has been working as a full stack developer from the very early days. It was always where my ambition lied because I loved the idea of being able to take something from an idea, build the front end, the back end, the database, connect it all up and actually go, I've made this thing. It wasn't quite tangible, but it was as close to tangible as you could get in the software development space. So that's basically where this is going. So um, we'll see what the next slide is, try and remember. Um, yeah, so right off the bat, um, Again, I know when I start talking about a lot of this stuff, you'll probably wince at me when I say some of these things, right? But just stick with me because the, the sentiment is there. Um, everyone thinks about stacks and they argue about things, right? So this is going to be a bit of a journey from full stack development, solution architecture. I'm going to finish up at product at the end of the, the, the meeting or whatever you want to call it. Clearly, I'm on Teams too often. Um, but whenever you're choosing a stack, how many of you actually have been at the beginning of a product or a or a uh, you know, a new solution and you've been involved in this, like choosing the stack, show of hands. Right, so maybe maybe about half of you, maybe a bit less than half of you, right? So a lot of people, whenever they get into involved in this at the beginning, right, is the first thing they'll think about is, well, what's the most exciting technology out there? It might be Remix JS, it might be Dino because it's out and it's not actually a preview yet and everyone goes, oh, that's 10 times quicker than the stuff that's actually out there, right? But what I'm going to talk to you about is, right, when you have to live with those decisions in two years' time, how you might think about them differently. So a lot of you probably have been in this room arguing about whether you should use React or Vue.js or Angular or whether you should use C Sharp or hopefully not PHP. I might wince if you say that. Um, but essentially, um, you know, you'll all have these discussions about it. But fundamentally, my challenge to you here today is to take a zoom out of that and actually think about what it is you're solving. And actually, if you can get out of the minutiae, and focus on the higher level, you'll suddenly see that as much as these decisions are important, we probably spend too much time thinking about them, and actually we should focus more on the problems we're solving, who we're solving them for, and how we get there. Um, some of the pitfalls I've already really mentioned, to be honest with you, right, so choosing something like a Remix JS, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm just choosing that as an example, I've never even used it, it's just that I see it in like um, Fireship IO videos, if you watch that channel, if not, very good one to watch. Um, but if you try to go hire a team when you start scaling out a team, and you have to hire a team of engineers. If you put out a CV, I mean, if, again, I'm sure that a lot of you show a hand how many people have been involved in the hiring process. So again, maybe a lot less actually that time. Whenever you get to that position, when you're right at the beginning of actually being involved in these projects, it's very easy to get excited and say, I want to use this technology, I want to use that. But whenever it's six months, 12 months, 24 months down the line, and you're trying to scale a team, and no one knows how to use that technology, suddenly that becomes a very difficult decision to make. And it's not things that people think about because they get carried away with the shiny object syndrome, if you will. So what I would suggest you do is actually you look at, um, <clears throat> you can actually look up online, like I'm sure you've all done this with GitHub, like starred repos and all the rest of it. But go look at like what people are actually using. 
So a lot of people, let's be honest, they all use React. But people that use Vue.js, Angular and stuff, that's fine. They're still pretty high up you know, repositories and all the rest of it. But if you can get more demand of React developers, it's probably a really good business decision to choose that stack. Whether or not you think Vue.js might have a 10% efficiency gain or whatever it might be, when you think about these other perspectives, these things will come into play. Similarly, with your back-end technology stack, so a lot of people, there's a very specific, I mean, I forget them, Mern, Mean, Stacks, all the rest of it, but there's a reason why people stick with a consistent setup, and it's because quite often the people that learn about that learn about the rest of them, and again, it's easier to hire. So just a few non-technical considerations to think about. You'll see that as a wee bit of a theme throughout this, um, but just not to be always focused on the technical when you're starting these things. Now, I'll give you some examples of things that I've learned this the hard way on. Now, GraphQL, I'm sure a lot of you have used. I love GraphQL. I was like preaching about GraphQL to everyone. I know I've got someone in the room who was actually a bit of a mentor to me on GraphQL, who I'll give a wee shout out to. He knows where he is. Um, helped me a lot with it, actually. It was really nice to see him tonight. Um, and I basically took that into the next company that I went to and actually implemented the similar stack. Fantastic for a front-end application, but the problem that I didn't consider when I was at the beginning stages building out that back end of the system was that in two years down the line, we were going to integrate with third party systems. And what do you know, the companies that we are integrating with might be, let's be a bit older, maybe not as, comp uh, as modern, and them integrating with GraphQL was a bit of a nightmare because they're only used to dealing with REST APIs. Now this is something I wouldn't have thought about until maybe someone like myself tonight would tell me this. You don't think about that, you just think, I'm gonna use GraphQL. I, I, Again, sorry I'm asking hands, but I like to just get a gauge of the room. How many people have used GraphQL? Yeah, again, maybe about 50%. So I'll try and give a, a quick description of it and hopefully the people that have used it don't you know, uh, sh shout me out. Um, but GraphQL, best way to think about it, REST APIs, you'll get your CRUD endpoints, you know, create, I, I always forget, create, read, update, delete, whatever it is. Um, GraphQL basically gives you queries and mutations. Queries are just getting information, mutations are just putting information up is a nice way to think about it. But the main premise of GraphQL is it allows you to over and under fetch. So with REST APIs, essentially you would have to create loads of endpoints for get person, get person's hair color, get person's eye color. With GraphQL, you can just create a get person endpoint and add to it through time. And everyone that's consuming that endpoint can use and pull the data that they want for it. So that was the selling point that I used it on. I thought it was fantastic, saved us a lot of time, made our front end development a lot quicker. But down the line, when we started to use it for third-party integrations, it's been a bit of a headache, and actually I would go, oh my God, it probably would have been easier to do an open API spec. So again, this is an example of one of those things that don't just think about the technology, think about the customers you're going to appeal to in six, 12, 24 months' time. Think about the direction of the business, the way it wants to go. And if you don't know the direction that's going to go, speak to the business. Speak to them about who their ideal customers are. You don't, it's not your job to know that. But one of the big things as technical people in the company is it's our job not to do exactly what the company asks. It's our job to interpret what they want and provide the best solution. And for a lot of you that are maybe at the early stages of your career, that's something that sounds a little bit alien because you kind of go, well, my boss has told me to you know, build a car. Why would I build them? How do I know whether to build them a Ferrari or a four-wheel drive car? We need to ask questions. You need to be inquisitive. You need to find out what they're actually trying to achieve down the line. And that's exactly what we'll help you with. Another little call out to a specific type of technology. I don't know if this person will end up watching the video, but there's a guy that I work with who's probably hands down the best engineer I've ever worked with in my life thus far. Um, and he basically introduced us to a technology called Temporal.io. Now, for those of you again who are starting out doing your full stack development, you're doing your React, your Redux, you're maybe getting a dabbling a little bit in TypeScript, you might get experience with it if you're on a back end, if you're dealing with like workflow management or queues or stuff like that. But Temporal basically is a workflow management tool that allows you to essentially schedule jobs in a super easy, asynchronous way. Now, if I was to build a, a new piece of software, I guarantee most of you would build out the front end, the back end, database, and whenever you click a button on the, the app, you send a request and you forget about it. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, how else do you do it? Right, like, what, what, how else does that work? You just send it and it works, doesn't it? Like, the internet's really consistent. We never have any issues with that. So obviously that's not true. So that's exactly where we pull things in, such as workflow engines. Now, I wish that was something I knew about back at the beginning of my career, because whenever you add it in later on, you realize, oh my God, the different, the different use cases for it. Now, workflow management system really is just a way of saying, instead of you sending the job out into the ether and hoping for the best, you basically add it to a queue that will have retries, so that if your customers, for example, when they're using your system, let's just say, um, you know, 
I don't know, your Lambda <coughs> function breaks down or your um, Azure function, whatever it might be, or whatever your storage is down, for whatever reason, or just the internet has just had a flaky and it dropped a few packets. Whatever that might be, Temporal is able to then say, well, I'll retry it and it'll do a thing called exponential back off, if I remember correctly, where it'll basically retry and it'll go up in an exponential time difference where it'll try it one second, go up the exponential pattern. But essentially what that gives you is um, robustness for your system. So you're not going to have customers coming back and going, well, the app gets stuck in this in-between state because you fire and forget and it never was able to uh, get back to it. So really, really something I would consider, right? And these are just little golden nuggets that people have shared with me. So hopefully they're beneficial to people. Config first. Who actually knows what I mean by config first? Some of you might wince when I say this. Like, does anyone have a guess of what I mean by config first? I mean, honestly, I wish everyone was like, you're clearly not as excited as I am here, by the way. We need to get a bit of energy in the room. Um, but no, config first, I mean, whenever we're, de whenever we're all developing, it's so easy to do a quick, a quick version of it and go, I'll hard code this, I'll come back and do it later. Litter the code with to-do statements, I'll come back and fix it at a later date. The best thing I have learned now is to spend the time and do config first. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to build a, a class about cars, don't hard code everything into it, make it config driven because once you actually deal with these businesses and you deal with different people, owners of businesses, clients, the next thing they're going to nine times out of 10 come back to you and say is, well, I'd like the Ferrari, I'd like the Land Rover, I'd like this. And if you've hard coded everything to be a Ferrari, the business just assumes, as I was saying earlier, because you don't do what the business asks, you interpret what the business needs and you provide the best solution for it. Part of that is that you have to make the assumption that they're going to ask you different things. You need to be careful not to prematurely optimize things. That's another separate topic and there's a fine balance between it. But essentially you want to be going config first. You want to get to the position where you can just drop in the variables and say, bang, there's a new car for you. Now that might seem obvious for maybe the more experienced people in here, but I know I've got a mixed crowd and I think these are really nice little nuggets of gold. Scalability is a, an interesting one. Um, scalability, um, you could have an argument on both ends of this. Um, Scalability, you could be going, actually, I want to deal with for 10 million users. Really, if you're actually only get 10 users, you don't need to solve for 10 million users. But you have to think about it. You have to think about your server sizes. Again, I'm going to, look, I'm going to talk about full stack experience. I'm going to talk through some specific subjects that um, I'll come back to on that. And coding standards and linters, I'm not going to talk about a lot. I'm sure you all know what they are, but just put them in. The amount of arguments that will save you having everyone because you prefer calling a variable this and they prefer doing it like this and I prefer a semicolon here. Just put them in from day one. You will avoid so many arguments, trust me. And I'm sure Alan's smiling because he knows what I'm talking about. Um, now, the next one. I mean, these all might sound a bit daft or maybe they're a bit obvious. They weren't to me. Whiteboards. The stuff on the board doesn't actually have any significance. I just thought it looked nicer than writing the word whiteboard. Um, it's really just the way that... So one of the big things that I think suffered whenever we've went remote is that we don't use whiteboards. And this might sound mental to people, right? But see whenever you're on calls and you're talking to your peers and you're talking to your colleagues, right? So basically that's dead easy. You don't even need to understand this. I've got a user up the front. They're using Active Directory. I go to the front end. I authenticate to the back end using Microsoft Authentication. And I've got a few connections out to my back end database. Easy, right? But if I was to try and describe that to someone without a visual representation, it's so bloody confusing. And people just take it for granted. And especially technical people, we assume everyone else sometimes understands things the way we do and we'll explain it and think they've got that same mental representation in their mind, which is just not the case. So I would encourage you all genuinely, right? And what I will say is you will get the piss taken out of you because I use a whiteboard in almost every meeting and everyone just does not stop moaning about it. But you can get a wee Wacom tablet for about 50 quid and I guarantee you when you're doing design sessions, it will make the world of a difference. And I'd actually love it if you've all used one and you sent me your whiteboards just so I can see them because it's genuinely, it, is a, it makes such a difference. But people are afraid to do it. People are afraid to take that ownership in a meeting, take that decision and go, this is what we're doing. I'd encourage every single one of you in this. I've had a few people talking to me tonight about experience. How do I do this? How do I do that? And I've said to you what I said to them. You do it by just doing it. If you're scared, do it scared. It doesn't matter. Every single one of you in the room, I don't know any more about this than you. I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here tonight that are going, I know all these things. And unfortunately, that might be the case for some of you. But a lot of people in the room don't. And that's the kind of audience that I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> but... I would just say to you, put yourself out there. It's going to be scared, scary. I was scared coming up here tonight. I mean, I'm buzzing now because the room of you is absolutely phenomenal, right? But, um, you know, just put yourself out there. Just do it. And as I say, we, considering all these different things, not getting bogged down in the minutiae about is it React, is it Vue.js, is it this? 
notice on my diagram, I'm not talking about technologies. I'm talking about parts of a solution. A lot of people get bogged down in the specifics. They would draw a diagram like this and they would say React. They would say C Sharp or they might say something like that. Don't do that. You just constrain your thinking and you end up you get caught in a debate with someone talking about, well, I don't want it to be React, I want it to be Vue.js. You spend half an hour arguing about that and you're no further along your solution of actually what is it we're building. And that, as I would say, for any of you that want to develop your career up the stack or up to, not up the stack, up the career ladder, whatever you want to say, um, clearly I'm talking in stacks too much. That is the bit of advice I would give you is actually if you can really take a zoom out and not focus on the technical details, but you can actually just look at a solution, it's, it'll, it'll skyrocket your career. And also just for me, it's more fun. Um, you're looking at a solution. You don't need to worry about the specifics. Um, so that probably leads me nicely on to the next point. What am I doing for time? Am I okay? I don't know. Jamie literally stepped out. That means I'm fine. I've got another 10 minutes. It's fine. Um, so on this, I take it most of you know, you know front-end, back-end, database. Does everyone know what an ORM is? Show of hands. Yeah, okay. So an ORM is an object relational mapper, right? So um, again, used one of these at a fantastic company. Um, but you, oh, an ORM basically is a, is a programmatic way to develop a database. So a lot of you will probably do a database in your university projects and you'll write raw SQL. How long have I got? Fine, there you go. That's how, that's how good it's going. Um, so I, that's everyone's going to be here sleeping, by the way, because I'll talk for another hour. Um, no, but I know I am object relational mapper. So a lot of you probably, now I, I predominantly, I don't really ever work with MongoDB, to be honest. I, um, whereas Aaron, Aaron was in this morning, before, or this afternoon, before he's doing the talk on it, the MongoDB support. I thought, flipping hell, man, that's dedication. Um, but I deal with SQL mostly, Postgres. Um, we've obviously had a lever already. It's not the type of talk for that person. Um, but an ORM basically allows you to programmatically develop a database. Um, you don't have to write raw SQL. You can introspect the database. So if you've got an existing database, you can fire an ORM at it. And basically what that'll do is it'll create a programmatic structure of that database. And it'll basically tell you, for example, as I come back to my cars example, you might have cars, wheels, tires, all the rest of it. You can introspect the database, it'll create objects, and then you can write queries in your coding language of choice. So for JavaScript, a lot of the most common ORMs is Prisma. Um, you get things like SQLize, you get, I forget, um, I think C Sharp was link queries. Um, and basically you can, say again, no, go for it. Entity framework. Entity framework, that's the one, thank you. I, I knew, what's the link framework? The link, the link is like, the, is the link, do you know what I'm talking about? It's like L-I-N-Q. Link you, thank you. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm calling it link. Yeah, no, entity framework. That's the one. Thank you very much. Um, but basically, these make your life easier. So you don't have raw SQL in your, your applications, right? Again, a lot of people don't know about these. So they'll write raw SQL. They'll send a request. They'll fire and forget. They won't have any workflow management. It will send it out to a string SQL statement that doesn't escape the characters, does none of this. It's super insecure. Something goes wrong, and then they go, shit, how do I fix this? Because there's no way to trace it. Whenever you add in these ORMs, it makes it a lot simpler to work with the data types that you've got. How many of you have used, genuinely, not just like you've, in the nicest way possible, not just you've, uh, you could do this, but you've maybe done more than say, deploy the Docker image to the cloud? Show of hands. Who's got a lot of experience in the cloud? Right, so like f far less, right? Get experience in the cloud. Go do something with it. Go use DigitalOcean. Go use Firebase. Go get the free tokens you get on Azure and AWS. You know, everyone, like loads of people, like you might not come up and talk to me now because I've said it, but quite often when I give talks like this, people come up and say, but how do you do that? How do you get the experience with this? And then I'll ask the question of, how many of you actually done stuff with cloud? And they'll get like five hands up. I'm like, well, there's your problem. Go do it. There's nothing stopping you. Go build a, a, build a, 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 a basket app, you know, build like something that you've got a passion for, build a diary, whatever it may be, but build it out as if it's a project. Give yourself deadlines, run sprints, Put in requirements, you can get, ask GPT for a fake problem to solve. That's a really good way of doing it. Give you a business requirement and tell it to be annoying, you know, tell it like, I've only got two week deadline, my boss has told me to do six weeks worth of work. That'll give you a realistic uh, experience, right? So, um, so do that though, but like genuinely do that and like, and, and get the feedback, like experience it. Um, one of the best things I've done, I mean, I used to build my own websites. I've done like web development and little web design projects. Um, and I used to deploy it on Firebase, and I'd done a little bit with DigitalOcean. Um, I cannot remember the other one. Netlify as well. They were all like sort of entry level, sort of way into cloud if you're looking for that type of thing. I would recommend Azure above AWS. I 
I love Azure. I go to AWS, and I just can't find anything in it. It's all just higgledy piggledy all over the place. Azure's got a really nice structure, so if you're trying to get to grips with the cloud computing, I would recommend you use Azure. Get the free credits, play about with it, just see how you can go. And hopefully the next time you're at a talk and someone says, have you done cloud, and everyone raises your hand, you've just totally made yourself stand out from the crowd because there was about six people, I think, or something like that that put their hands up here. So hopefully that's another nice point. Again, I've mentioned on security, I bet you a lot of you don't consider security whenever you're developing apps beyond maybe like the basics of like, you know, you put a password in front of it. Hopefully you're not doing like an MD5 password. You've maybe used something like Bcrypt at least or you're using JWT, something of significance, but the, the different levels of it, right? Um, again, look at the security stuff. Maybe do some of the, o I think it's, um, I'm going to butcher this, but the OSINT stuff, you know, like look at things like dependable um, uh, CVEs, Familiarize yourself with all these things. I can't remember. I think CVEs, it's like critical vulnerabilities and something. Someone else can tell me the E, what that stands for. Um, but these are all parts of a stack, of a full stack application, of a product that no one thinks about. And we all focus on doing, I know my React, I know my TypeScript, I know my database. And then they get thrust into the real world and they start working on a project and then they go, oh my God, I've got to do this. I've got to do ORM, I've got to do cloud security, requirements gathering, team management. Oh my God, how do I do this? So what I'm trying to tell you is, I wish someone told me about this five years ago, because I've had to learn the hard way by getting thrust into the deep end, and I love that. Like this is why I love this type of thing. It gets my adrenaline going, right? And it's like it's a nice way to do it. But I would say to you, really familiarise yourself with that. I've kind of alluded to it with GPT, but again, quick show of hands. How many of you have actually been involved in requirements gathering? I know it sounds a bit dry. So that's a decent number of people in the room right now. See the people that haven't done requirements gathering. What I would really encourage all of you to do when you're in your work in the next couple of days um, is ask people in your team if you can shadow them. It's one of the most valuable skills. I talked about whiteboarding, right? If you can do requirements gathering and you can convert that to a whiteboard and you've got the full stack understanding to say, this is how we need to build the front end, here's the back end the back in the database, I swear to God that you are absolutely miles ahead of the competition. And it's also a really fun space to be in. That's why I love it. I feel very fortunate that I got to work on solution architecture and then doing technical product. And I love it. You're, you, you get yourself into a position where you get to collaborate with every person in the business. And it's phenomenal. Your days are just like, never, never one day is the same. Um, and the final one I'll talk about is team management. Now, it's not maybe relevant for full stack experience. It's more kind of coming into the, the product realm, the management side of things. But again, a lot of you might be sitting here, I don't know, you might not want to, you might want to do team management, it might not be your thing, it's okay if it's not, but if it is your thing and you might be thinking to yourself, how do I get to that next stage? Just ask, just ask, just try and do it. Offer yourself up if there's, maybe you're not gonna to get to run a product or a solution, but when there's a nice big feature coming up, something that you're maybe passionate about, um, I'll give you an example, one of the companies I was at, I was only there for about, um, I think four months, and I referenced that MD5 and Bcrypt for a reason their passwords were still MD5 hashes that were uh, like the old version of MD5. They were all like not collision resistant. They were easily just rainbow mapped out. They're just absolute sham. And I, they were talking about making it Bcrypt, which if any don't know what Bcrypt is, it's like a, it's just a different hashing algorithm that you can change the number of iterations and it's supposedly future proof, right? Um, but there was loads of people on the team that were far more experienced than me. But I just said, well, I'd love to do that. And to my surprise, they went, right, on you go, no bother. And I got to change the entire security premise around this system and I've been there for four months. But a lot of people would be afraid to ask that. And what the point I'm making to you is, if you give yourself familiarised with all these things, when that opportunity comes up, you can grab it with both hands. But you can't get grab those opportunities. And people will come and say to me, but why am I not getting an opportunity? And as I say, then I say, how many have you done cloud? And five people got that. So if you can familiarise with these, yourself with these things, put yourself in that position, you then get to be the person that builds a full stack, that builds the product that builds a solution out, and I just think that's a phenomenal place to be. Um, things I wish I did sooner, to be honest, I've talked a little bit about this. I just want to check where I'm at with this because I just saw a rattle through the end of this. Um, workflow management I've spoke about, really, that's the temporal thing. Testing frameworks, I'll give a two second on. I know you'll, you're, you'll be sick of hearing this. Put the testing framework in from day dot. I don't know, again, if you're all doing that. I'm expecting people to be doing TDD, maybe even BDD if you're into it but get the testing framework in place. Whenever you get too long into it and you've not got the testing, it's an absolute nightmare to add it back in. And when I come to the very end of this slide, which I'm nearly there, you'll understand why this becomes very important. 
Automated workflows, I'm really referencing your GitHub releases or your release strategies so that it's fully automated. Again, maybe that's a separate topic for another day. Team management, assigning specific roles to people. Whenever you're in a team and you are maybe the front-end developer, the back-end developer, you need to have someone that says specifically, I expect this from you, I expect that from you. If you don't do that, your team is going to become uh, very higgledy-piggledy and not know what to do. I can see people moving about, so I think I'm going to try and go through to the end of this quickly. I'll skip over a lease. Um, product experience, I'll go very quickly. Product experience, for me, is the epitome of full-stack development. It's the zooming out. You go from zooming out from, from one end of it, you then fill out to full stack, then you zoom out to solutions where you do your whiteboards and your cloud architecture and your security. And then you take a view out again and you start building products where all of that stuff is drilled down. Now, I've had been very fortunate to get to the point I've been able to do this, and I think it's genuinely one of the most exciting jobs ever. Now, what I would say to all of you is when you get to the position where you're trying to run a, a product team and they don't have tests in the system, and so if something breaks, and I give the example of the, uh, the Ferrari or the Range Rover, if you don't have tests in place and you cannot fix that, it's the most frustrating thing ever because there's not an easy way for you to get what your, what your clients want, essentially. Now, all of this is to say, and I hope it's been, you can see a little bit of the journey I'm trying to talk through, starting out from full stack development, if you follow those, like, um, uh, how would I say, those standards that I'm talking about, familiarize yourself with all these things, I'm hoping from the room, because everyone is sitting quite still, right? I'm hoping that some of you have learned something from this. I'm hoping that some of the technology that I've mentioned is something new to you, something that you can actually go learn about or impl um, implement in your work, um, and really ultimately get you towards product and product experience, and so that you're not focused on the wrong things, such as naming variables, worrying about the colors you use, but in fact, getting to build real solutions for people in the real world, and actually getting to really have an impact out there. So. I think I've ran over a little bit. I hope that was interesting for everyone, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I think the, what you said there at the end, it's so valuable, like knowing what you're doing in service of. Yeah. And I think that's the sort of definition. I've been in a lot of meetings where you sort of talk about things, you go back and forth, and then you're like, why actually are we yeah. doing this? Yeah. You know, and sometimes yeah. the answer is, well, I don't know, did, was this from a requirement or yeah. where, is it just an idea that one of us had? I don't yeah. know. Um, so that's great. Um, give a uh, chance for questions from the audience. Before you do that, you mentioned Netlify, and I'm just going to plug Edinburgh JS oh. in February uh, <laughs> has uh, Phil from Netlify coming to speak to us, which oh, is really? a great thing. Yep. Uh, so he's going to talk all about Netlify and serverless and you know, the pipeline. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about the cloud, yeah. come through to Edinburgh in February. Uh, you'll find all the information on the Edinburgh JS group. Um, does anybody have any questions for Ryan about his talk or like learning full stack? Um, I'll be disappointed if I don't get at least one question. So don't, don't disappoint the guy. Joe, there we go. <laughs> right. uh, Joe, can I give you the mic for the live stream? Cheers. Uh, thank you for sharing. And uh, I'd like to ask that uh, how do you balance your attention about the developing and the product? So, how do you balance the attention between product and development? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Do you mean basically how do you prioritize whether to do the development efforts or the product efforts? Maybe a wee bit clarification, yeah. Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a balance about the uh, product design or product manager and the coding and the developing stuff. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Good question. So that's something that I actually um, struggled with at the beginning. Um, I, because I came from a technical background, when I was getting involved in tech, now I'm not a full-on product manager, I'm a technical product engineer, really, to be honest. Now, at first, you want to focus on everything being the technical solution. But again, Jamie made a fantastic point there. It has to be driven by the business requirements. It has to be driven by what are the customers wanting. So I mentioned as well about scalability there at the beginning. If you've got 100 customers and you've got a, you've got a development task where you know you could make it work for 10 million customers and it's going to take you six months and all of us would sit and go, that's the best bit of engineering I've ever seen, right? What's the point? No one's going to pay for it, right? Seriously, and you'd all sit and go, I've done that. It's fantastic. It's irrelevant. If you've got 100 customers, what do those 100 customers want? What provides them the most value? What provides you with you know, monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue, more sales, more interest, whatever it is you're, you're basing your product um, you know, success on? That has to be the driver. But as technical people, that's something that we often forget because we're focused, as I say, 
on, I want to use React, I want to use Vue, I want to use that. So that was what I would say is, is really understand your end user, your customer, what is success to you. And suddenly when you understand that, it becomes very clear where you have to put your efforts. I think you had a question. It's my only two questions, so we'll go for it. We're not wasting too much time. Uh, yeah, so my thing is coming from a generalist perspective. Yeah. So uh, for me, at least, uh, my like uh, I'll give you an example. So for me, there was a business who asked for, you know, they had to create an MVP within a short time, yeah. right? So I went with Flutter and, you know, I got their uh, business requirement and Flutter, you know, Flutter and Firebase sound perfect to me and it, you know, uh, was working all the requirements were sitting within the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, feature restrictions of Firebase yeah, yeah. and Flutter, right? But later on, uh, during the development, there was uh, addition of the feature, like uh, the background location should yeah, be yeah. automatically turned on, which is a kind of a bit hassle for the Flutter. Yeah. And for example, we had to suggest random users. Yeah. So the uh, fetching of random users from... Uh, Date from the documents was uh, wasn't a feature which was provided by Firebase. Yeah. So on one side we talk okay, be a general generalist, but to figure out these shortcomings, you have to be some kind of you know uh, your expert. yeah expert. So how do you balance that? Like, so if you were to talk about let's think of I seem to use not a car references. Think about an F one team. You've got the manager of the team. He knows when something's broken, but he doesn't actually have to fix it himself. He's got, an, he's got a mechanic that fixes it. So the job of a generalist isn't to be the expert on everything. You quite often choose one or the other. You either become an individual contributor that's seriously expert in something, or you become a generalist. So in that example, what I would be saying is, well, if I was the generalist, which I would be in the situation you've given, I'd be looking at your example and going, right, okay, we obviously need to change the dynamics. I'm going to pull in one of the people on the team that's an expert in that. I'm going to explain the problem. The communication is obviously super important. I'm going to express the problem, let them understand the definition of done, give them the clear roles as I mentioned, let them figure it out and trust in them to figure it out because that's something that's very difficult to let go of. Let them figure it out and come back to me and then I can communicate that outwards. But you don't have to know everything. I don't, you will all know more about loads of things than me. It doesn't matter because I can understand it enough so that I can have a conversation with you. But it, it's not, nothing to feel bad about. You shouldn't feel intimidated by the fact that you're not the expert in it. You can't be the expert in everything. And the minute you realize that is actually where you sort of unlock your potential because you've not held back by limiting beliefs, essentially. I don't know if that's a good answer or if it's just yeah, a motivational one, but I genuinely do believe that. <laughs> <laughs> cool, right, I'm going to sit down before Jamie knocks me out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good, cool. Everybody, round of applause for Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Um,